Are the Jews the chosen people of God post death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? And how does that fit in with the traditional Catholic worldview? And does the Novus Ordo and Vatican II blur the lines of traditional Catholic doctrine? That is going to be the discussion for this episode. everyone hope you guys are having a fantastic day welcome to the traditional Thomas hope you guys are enjoying this great and holy week that we just began at least at the time of this recording it is holy Monday it's great to be hopping on back with you guys coming at you guys with a spicy conversation about the subject of replacement theology dispensationalism what is the place of the Jews in the New Testament period in which we are living in it's a very good subject because on on the one hand, You do see in the world of foreign policy a lot of discussion right now when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. By the way, we're not really getting into that in this video, so if you're looking for politics in this episode, it's not really going to be the main focus. But we're also right seeing on social media, in various Catholic internet forums and videos, a whole lot of discussion about this happening. Right, A few days ago, I did an interview with my friend um, Jordan and Rudy over on the Glad Trad podcast. I'm going to link this episode in the show below. We were talking about Candace Owens being canned from the Daily Wire, potentially over this whole subject of the subject of the Jews and their place in the New Testament time period. I wanted to go ahead and give a more fuller treatment today because the new mass, in my opinion, fundamentally in this area of theology, as well as bringing a lot of its sources from Vatican II and the post-Vatican II popes, really does blur the line of traditional Catholic theology when we start to dig down into the meat and potatoes of the teaching of the church. You're going to see how it veils it and how it starts to if you will, uncomfortably placate some very uncatholic tendencies, right? We see this video, right, if I'm being honest, is really made in as a response almost to what is going on right now in the USCCB conference where the USCCB is really concerned right now about Christians going to Mass and coming away with an anti-Semitic understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, of the Passion narrative. Now, while this video is not intended to be um, you know, targeted toward Jews or used anything like that. I'm against anti-Semitism 110%. I'm against Nazism, and I condemn it categorically and totally. I think it's totally evil. Just because of those things, I also want to touch upon this real reality of a theological aspect of what is the place of the Jews today in the New Testament period, and how, unfortunately, I think the USCCB really taking its marching orders from the Vatican, the Council, and the Nova Sordo is really blurring the lines of the traditional Catholic faith when it comes to this. So that's going to be the subject matter of this episode. Before we dive in, make sure and like this video, subscribe to the show if you're not already part of it, and also consider donating down below. Traditional Thomas, right? It is down there in the description below, patreon.com slash traditional Thomas. It's all your gifts are absolutely appreciated, and I thank you guys so much for that. That being said, let's go ahead and get into the discussion. So what we're first going to do, this is what we're going to do. We're going to first start off with this question of, is the Old Covenant, right, is the Old Covenant still an act today, right? It, does it still exist today? Do people still participate in it, et cetera? And to do this, we're going to go back to the traditional Catholic dogmatic and fundamental manuals to examine what has the Church traditionally taught on this matter. We're also going to be in that looking at what have the popes taught at it, particularly Pope Pius XII in his document, Mystici Corporis, right, on the body of Christ as well as looking at St. Thomas, of course, in his famous Summa Theologiae, as well as a few of his commentaries in the Gos- or, excuse me, in the Epistle of uh, St. Paul to the Romans. 
we'll conclude this with a few dogmatic definitions that were given, particularly at the Council of Florence, two of which I'm wanting to talk about, one of which is well known today. It's the discussion, Concante Domino. It's the definition that talks about no salvation outside the church, and it's perhaps maybe the most, um, I would say, long, if you will, definition on the subject. But we're also going to get into Florence's discussion about the Mosaic Law, about the ceremonial aspects of the Mosaic Law. Are they or are they not still in effect today? We're going to ground ourselves in all of this traditional Catholic faith first. And then with this, we're going to examine Vatican II, particularly Lumen Gentium and Nostra Aetate. And moving forward from that, we're going to see how these documents have been interpreted, particularly by ecumenical organizations that have tried to shut down missionary work to Jews, right? Particularly through the embassies and the headship of a one Cardinal Walter Casper. We're going to look at Pope Benedict XVI's own kind of, I would say, ambiguous teaching on this matter um, that's kind of been all over the place. Even more ambiguously, we're going to be looking at a lot of uh, Pope John Paul II's um, confusing rhetoric about the subject. And then finally closing it out with the current pontificate, Pope Francis. And looking and seeing what he has. We'll also touch, of course, upon how the new catechism um, compares to the traditional catechism of the Council of Trent in this matter. All right, all of that now being said, let's go ahead and dive into this discussion, right? Are the Jews still the chosen people of God, and is the Old Covenant still in effect? All right, so here we are. This is the Sacre Theologia Summa, which was a set of 1950s fundamental and dogmatic manuals written by a group of Thomistic Jesuits in Spain. Don't worry, the Jesuits back in Spain in the 1950s were absolute chads and base. They were very orthodox, very rigorous in their theology. And this comes from the manual De Ecclesia, right, on the church. Side note, we're going to be going through this whole manual as, long, as well as the entire um, collection of this manual series later in this year once we get done with our new mass series and a few other things. But this is a good question. So, in understanding the Church of God, right, in understanding this New Testament question, these theologians basically posit, right, this question at the end of one of their treatises, right, this statement, rather. So they teach, and this is, again, the official teaching of the Church in this matter, Christ not only preached a religious and universal kingdom, right, so when Christ was on earth, he didn't just preach the reality of the kingdom of God being a religious and universal kingdom, as we have seen, but he also said that the religious economy of the Old Testament, so the covenant of the Old Testament, was going to be abrogated, right, done away with, abolished, and for it he substituted a new religious order. So the official teaching of the church is this. When Christ came on earth, he abolished the Old Testament, right, the Old Covenant in his blood, and established the New Testament, the new order, right, the new economy of salvation. We're going to get into some of the details now. So we are saying, one, that Christ meant that the Old Testament was going to be abrogated, right? So the Old Testament was meant to be abrogated, to be abolished, because in the Gospels we do not find words of Christ explicitly abrogating the Old Testament. And although in the books of the Old Testament, the New Testament is announced, and it gives us some examples, right? Jeremiah 31, 31, Hebrews 8, 8, Isaiah 53, 3. Nevertheless, the post-prophetic books remain silent about this, and during the time of Christ, the Jews generally consider the Old Testament as absolute and eternal, right? So in the Old Testament, the Jews considered their covenant to be something that was everlasting, eternal. But when we even look at the Old Testament itself, right? For instance, in this passage of Jeremiah 31, 31, as well as Isaiah 53, 3, we see the, the proclamation, the prophetic utterance of a new covenant that is supposed to take place, right? And he says this, however, since the Old Testament finally was to be abrogated by the death of Christ, so the Old Testament was done away with at Christ's death, it is not surprising that Christ acknowledged this in his life first, or A, in his private life, Right, he was circumcised and presented in the temple, right, and he celebrates Passover. Two, in his public life, he acknowledges the temple, the priests, and the scribes, the Sanhedrin, and the prerogative of the people of Israel regarding the priority of election and the custody of revelation. And you see these verse citations when it comes to each one of these. The law itself, right, and the value of the Old Testament. So when we come to this, right, we see that Christ observed the Old Testament both in his private life. And in his public life, because, number one, he's God, right? He's the one who inspired the Old Testament, and he keeps the Old Testament perfectly. Um, but also, too, because he is fulfilling this in his blood. He's fulfilling this in his coming. 
The meaning of the future abrogation of the Old Testament is certain from the words of Christ himself. Now, when you see this phrase certain in theological textbooks, this certain means not just like, yes, we know this, but theologically, we know this to be exact, right? This is not something that can be questioned. This is something that is absolute. So we know that the Old Testament is abrogated in the theological sense. We know that this is an absolute truth, if you will, of the Catholic faith. For the essential elements of the Old Testament, right, all of these things were fulfilled and done in the person of Christ. So, for instance, when we look at these essentials, right, circumcision, as it says here, the temple, the Sabbath, the Levitical purity laws, right, the prerogatives of the people of Israel, right, so how they dealt with one another, the law itself, right, all of these things are fulfilled in Christ. How so? Let's look at some of these examples. He says, but Christ equates circumcision with healing, right, John chapter 7, verse 22. He announces that the temple is to be destroyed and emptied, right, in St. Matthew's Gospel in these two places. He terminates the Sabbath and says that he is the Lord of it and the temple, right, Lord of it and of the temple, right? So Christ does away with the Old Testament Saturday Sabbath, and he proclaims himself as the Lord of the Sabbath as well as the temple, right, referring to his body. He rejects the Levitical purity. Now, when he says rejects, it's not talking about like rejects as this, this is evil, this is heretical or something. No, but he supersedes it, right? He rejects the prerogative of the people of Israel, right? And he completes and perfects the law itself, and he abolishes it as it insinuates, right? So he does away with the Old Testament law, right, referring to the ceremonial law, right? the civil law, the washings and the cleansings and the fibers and the fabric and the dietary stuff, etc. He does away with all this. Now, one important note I want to say is that when it comes to the moral law, right, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, right, the Ten Commandments, the other moral laws that it came to when it, in regards to how to treat other individuals, right, when it came to um, laws that were prohibiting impure um Ab abnormal and immoral sexual activities, right? All of these things remain in effect today because they are part of the natural law, right? So they're not to be done away with, right? There's a lot of Protestants who actually end up doing uh, that, not just in well, progressive Christian groups, right? So the progressive liberal mainline denominations now, but also in a form of um, basically theological conservatism um, called antinomianism on the other extreme, which basically um, is against the Old Testament law and thinks that Christians will kind of just naturally keep it, but they don't need to be commanded. It. It's very interesting. So he says this, right? <clears throat> so Christ fulfills all this, and it says, we are saying one or two, that Christ has substituted the new religious order from the Old Testament because he explicitly says that its nature is only pre uh, preparatory and declarative of the new order to be established in him. And especially because Christ instituted a new covenant in his blood in the place of that which Yahweh had declared uh, for the people of Israel in the blood of animals through the mystery of Moses, or the ministry of Moses. So Christ fulfills the Old Testament law, and he establishes a new law in the new covenant. So we see the, um, if you will, institution of the old law right here. In Exodus 24, 8, right, Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. But Christ establishes a new covenant, right? In St. Luke's gospel, we see here, Luke twenty two twenty, 20, right? Our Lord Jesus Christ took and likewise the cup after saying, this is the cup which is poured out for you is of the new covenant of my blood, right? At the time of this, right, this video should be posting on Holy Wednesday, right? Spy Wednesday. And so, um, Think about these re this reality that the New Testament is um, instituted in Christ's blood, right? Especially as you're going to, right, um, if you do get a chance to go to Holy Thursday's Mass, right, Monday Thursday's Mass. And then he finishes right here when he says simil the similarity between the two covenants is clear of the form. The words themselves which Christ used, right, necessarily had uh, to remind the apostles of the Old Covenant. But the difference is also manifest because the new covenant is sealed not with the blood of animals, but with the precious blood of the Son of God. Christ in the new covenant completed and also perfected in the prefiguration of the old covenant, right? And it signifies right here Denzinger 1348, which we're going to go ahead now and look up because this is going to now move us into some of what Aquinas writes and some of what the Pope's um, speak about when it comes to this subject. All right, so here we are now at the Council of Florence, 
One thing I should mention real quick before we dive into this highlighted portion is that Catholic theology manuals are part of the magisterium. So what I just read wasn't merely just the opinion of some theologians, but was rather an extension, if you will, by the teaching arm of the magisterium. We just have to get that kind of out of the way so that people understand that. But you saw that the theology manual referenced this section from Dinsinger. Well, this comes from the Council of Florence. Sometimes it's called the Council of Basil, but the Council of Florence. And we're going to look at this dogmatic language that it uses in reference to what we just learned. So we just learned that the Old Testament, right, that was summed up in great parts such as the temple, the Sabbath, the old law, right, the, the, the nation of Israel, all of these things are abolished, abrogated, done away with in the death. Of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We also saw a lot of the scriptural references, right? I go, I re recommend you guys go back, check out those references so that you'll be able to see the biblical citations for all of those. Now we're going to go ahead and dive into this section, though. This is the dogmatic teaching of the Council of Florence, right? So the dogmatic teaching of the Catholic Church. We're going to be looking at these four paragraphs right here because these first three firstly really focus in on this idea of the Old Testament, the old law being abolished in Christ. The second aspect, though, is going to be talking a little bit more about the reality of sin and no salvation outside the church. Might be a bit more familiar with some of you guys. So it says this, it firmly, so the church, right, it firmly believes, professes, and teaches, right, so this is dogmatic language, that the legal prescriptions of the Old Testament and of the Mosaic law, which are divided into ceremonies, holy sacrifices, and sacraments, because they were instituted to signify something in the future, all they, although they were adequate for the divine cult of that age, once our Lord Jesus Christ, who was signified by them, has come, came to an end, and the sacraments of the New Testament had their beginning. So what does all this first section mean? It means that the Old Testament, right, the Old Testament, as it says here, sacraments, ceremony, sacrifices, they're ceased to be at the time of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's death and of the institution of the new sacraments through the New Testament. He says, whosoever, or whosoever after the Passion, now this is very important, this, this section is so important, whosoever after the Passion places his hope in the legal prescriptions and submits himself to them as necessary for salvation, and as if faith in Christ without them could not save, sins mortally. It is a mortal sin, right, against the faith, to go back and to practice the Old Testament law, thinking that you're going to be saved by those things. It says right here, it does not deny that from Christ's passion, or it does, uh, it does not deny that from Christ's passion until the promulgation of the gospel, they could have been retained, provided that there were, uh, there were in no way believed to be necessary for salvation. But its assertion that after the promulgation of the gospel, they cannot be observed without the loss of salvation. Therefore, it denounces all who after the time observe circumcision, Sabbath, and other legal prescriptions as strangers of the faith of Christ and unable to share in eternal salvation unless they recoil at some time from these errors. Therefore, it strictly orders all, right, this is the church saying it, right, so the church strictly orders all who glory in the name of Christian not to practice circumcision either before or after baptism, since whether or not they place their hope in it, it can possibly be observed without the loss of eternal salvation. Now, one quick important note, sometimes people will ridicule this last sentence, and is it, they'll say, are you not saying that the Catholic Church is teaching that if you are circumcised, regardless of whether or not you believe that it's necessary for salvation or not, um, you're going to hell, right? You're, you can't be saved. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about those people who, um, whether or not they place hope in uh, circumcision, still think that it is an ordinance that you're supposed to keep, right? And that is, of course, something that's wrong. It's an attack against the virtue of faith, this heresy, et cetera, right? Not so much talking about circumcision in a medical sense. And we'll see that St. Thomas affirms this in just a little bit. He says, with regard to uh, children, since the danger of death is uh, so present and only remedy available to them is the holy sacrament of baptism, by which they are snatched away from the dominion of the devil and adopted as children of God. It admonishes that sacred baptism is not to be deferred for 40 or 80 days or any other period of time in accordance with the usage of some people, but it should be confirmed as soon as is conveniently can. And if there is imminent danger of death, 
the child should be baptized straight away without any delay, even by a layman or, or woman in the form of the church, right? So I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. If there is no priest and it contained more fully in the decree of the Armenians. So what the church is teaching is children don't need to be circumcised. They need to be baptized. Baptism is the fulfillment of circumcision, right? See Colossians chapter two. I think it's around verse 11 or so. Therefore, right, baptism ought not to be delayed for children, right? It gives the uh, the limit of 40 to 80 days. I think that the church has actually subsequently shortened that. Um, I personally think that you need, you know, as the church teaches right here, you need to do it as soon as possible, right? Within a day or two, right? Strive really, really soon to baptize your child because as it says here, baptism snatches away the child, right, who's in the throes of um uh, original sin from the dominion of the devil and it adopts them as the child of god if a priest is not available do it yourself lay people are allowed to baptize pour water over the child's head and say i baptize thee in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost or the holy spirit so now it gets back into some of this dogmatic language and this is very important it says it firmly believes professes and teaches that every creature of god is good and nothing to be rejected if it is be received with thanksgiving, right? So it's talking about the food and the dietary laws. Because according to the word of the Lord, not only that which goes into the mouth defiles a person, but because of the difference of the Mosaic law between clean and unclean foods, belongs the ceremonial practices to which have passed away and lost their efficacy with the coming of the gospel. It also declares that the apostolic prohibition to abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and that which is strangled was suited to that time even uh, when a single church was rising from Jews to Gentiles who previously lived uh, in different ceremonies and customs. This was that the Gentiles should have, uh, should have some observances in common with the Jews and occasion should be offered in the coming uh, together of one worship and a faith of God and a cause of the dissension might be removed since by the ancient custom of blood, the strangled thing seemed to be abominable to the Jews and the Gentiles could thought to be re running, returning to their idolatry if they ate sacrificial foods. In place, however, where the Christian religion had been promulgated to such an extent that no Jew is to be met with all that have joined to the church, uniformly practicing the same rites and ceremonies of the gospel and believing that it is to, clean, uh, to the clean things that are clean, since the cause from the apostolic prohibition has ceased, so that its effects has ceased. It condemns, then, no kind of food that human society accepts, and nobody at all, neither man nor woman, should make a distinction between animals, no matter how they died, though they be uh, for the healthy body, for the practice of virtue, or for the sake of regular and ecclesiastical disciplines, since many things are not per, uh, not prescribed, can be omitted, as the apostle says, are lawful, but not all things are helpful. So it's saying that the church is saying, outside of her disciplines, right, when she commands fasting of her children, foods in and of itself, there's no such thing as clean or unclean anymore. This has been done away with in the New Testament, including in the book of Acts, where you see the apostles prohibit people from eating food that had uh, blood in it, right? This ancient discipline has been now done away. Now, it gets into this final section right here that we're going to talk about. And this is perhaps one of the most um, famous, if you will, passages from the Council of Florence. It says, it firmly believes, professes, and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews or heretics and schismatics, cannot share an eternal life and will go into the everlasting fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels unless they are joined to the Catholic Church before the end of their lives. That the unity of the ecclesiastical body is of such importance that not only those who abide in it do the Church's sacraments contribute to salvation and do fast, all givings and other works of piety and practices of Christian militia produce eternal rewards, and that nobody can be saved no matter how much he has given away in alms, and even if he has shed his blood in the name of Christ, unless he is preserved in the bosom in the unity of the Catholic Church. This is the teaching of the Church in this matter when it comes to no salvation outside the Church. That being said, what does the Church teach on this subject? There's a lot I could say into this, but short version of this answer is that the church teaches in a hypothetical sense that people can be saved outside of the visible bounds of her church, right? What that means, of course, is that in spite of their false religions, if in the abstract sense they were to hypothetically keep the whole moral law, have charity and desire, union with God, right, there is a possibility, right, in the abstract sense. But then when you get into the practical realm, 
how often do people really keep the law perfectly? I don't really think that's a thing. And so while the church definitely um, opens that door up for a possibility, it's definitely not a, uh, a an assured thing, that's for sure. And there's many canons of various documents, including, right, Famously, in Pius the Ninth's um, Syllabus of Errors, a whole section condemning the idea that it would be um, probable for someone to have salvation outside of the visible bonds of the church. All right, so here we are now at St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa. This comes from the Prima Secundae, right? So the first part of the second part, question 103. In this whole section, St. Thomas is talking about the, the broad concept of law. What law is, the various kinds of law, the natural law, the eternal law— the positive law, etc. But now we're talking specifically about the Old Testament law. And in question 103, he has four articles, and it's of the duration of the ceremonial precepts. So we're talking now mostly about those ceremonial things like the dietary, the ceremonial um, observance of the Sabbath, those types of things that we've seen both in the Council of Florence as well as in the manual. And we're going to be talking mainly about whether or not it is a mortal sin to observe them after the coming of Christ, right? Because we've seen clearly that it's abolished in his blood, but we've also clearly seen that um, one should not be participating in him. But we're going to be asking specifically the question whether or not it is sinful. Now, we saw this already. It is sinful according to the Council of Florence, but we're going to get into some more, um, I would say, of the nitty-gritty, if you will, in this discussion. So he asked this question right up here, whether since Christ's passion, right, so since his death, the legal ceremonies can be observed without committing mortal sin. I'm going to go ahead and read the on the contrary, and then the I answer that section. So he says, on the contrary, right, the apostle says, right, and the apostle is referring to St. Um, Paul, right, Galatians 5, 2, if you be circumcised, Christ shall not shall profit you nothing, right? St. Paul is saying, if you go after circumcision, thinking that you need it in order to observe God, right, whether or not you think that you're saved by it or not, right, it is nothing. Christ's death profits you nothing. And then he continues, right, St. Thomas, but— Nothing save mortal sin hinders us from receiving Christ's fruit. Therefore, since Christ's passion, it is a mortal sin to be circumcised or to observe the other legal ceremonies, right? So now we're going to get into this. I answer that all the ceremonies and professions of faith in which the interior worship of God consists. Now, man can make profession of his inward faith by deeds as well as by words, and in either profession, if he make a false declaration, he sins mortally, right? So man, right, he professes his internal beliefs by his actions, by his words, etc. But if he does this in a false religion, right, this is a mortal sin. Now, therefore, our faith in Christ is the same as that of the fathers of old, right, the church fathers, and also the Old Testament fathers. Yet since they came before Christ, whereas we come after him, the same faith is expressed in different words, by us and by them. For by them was it said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, whereas the verbs are in the uh, future tense, whereas we express the same by means of the verbs in the past tense, and say that she is conceived and bore. In like manner, the ceremonies of the old law, notice this, Betokened Christ, right, prefigured Christ as having yet to be born and to suffer, whereas our sacraments, right, the, the seven sacraments of the church, signify him as already born and having suffered. Consequently, just as it would be mortal sin now, uh, now for anyone to make a profession of faith, right, to say that Christ is yet to be born, which the fathers of old said devoutly and truthfully, so too it would be a mortal sin now to observe these ceremonies which the fathers of old fulfilled with devotion and fidelity. Such is the teaching of St. Augustine, right, who says, quote, It is no longer promised that he shall be born, shall suffer, and shall rise again, truths of which their sacraments were a kind of image. But it is declared that he is already born, he has suffered and risen again, of which our sacraments, in which Christians share, are the actual representation. So what does this mean? It means that just as the Old Testament fathers had the same faith that we do, they expressed it differently than we. They were looking forward to the coming of Christ in both their profession and their ceremonial laws. They were prefiguring, they were expecting, they were waiting the coming of Christ, his passion, and his resurrection. We, on the other hand, on this side of the cross, if you will, look back, right? We look back at Christ's death. 
his resurrection, right? And our sacraments, right, which are instituted by Christ, reflect this reality of the looking back to the death of Christ. All of the sacraments of the new law have their efficacy from the death passion of Christ, right? And so therefore, it would be mortally sinful for us to be looking back and practicing stuff that is looking forward to the coming of Christ, right? We're not going to go back and um, observe the Sabbath or the fabric laws. We're not going to go back and observe actions such as Seder meals and things along that nature. These would be mortally sinful, and it's quite sad because there's a lot of cultural Catholics who go and celebrate you know, Passover meals or Seder meals, etc., when these things are mortally sinful for Catholics to participate in. All right, so here we are now at Pope Benedict um, the 14th, right, encyclical ex quo, right? And this discussion is very good because it talks about this whole various discussion in paragraph 61 and following on this subject of the Old Covenant, right? This is going to be the second to last pre-conciliar document that we look on this, and then we're going to get into a lot of the controversy with the post-conciliar conciliar church, right? So Pope um, Benedict the Fourteenth, he says this, the first consideration is that the ceremonies of the Mosaic Law were abrogated by the coming of Christ, and that they no longer can be observed without sin after the promulgation of the gospel, right? And then he goes on into the discussion, as we can see right here, with discussions about food laws that we see. He also touches upon, right, this great work right here, he says, the preceding words are from the profession of the Orthodox faith, which Pope Urban the Eighth required of the Oriental, right, the Oriental schismatics, as published in the Congregation for the Promulgation of the Faith in 1642. And they are in harmony with, as you can see right here, the teaching of St. Thomas's Summa that we just went ahead and looked at, right? This basic understanding, as that we can see from here, is that the ceremonies, the old law, have been done away with and that they can no longer be observed without sin, right, after the promulgation of the gospel. And he gives the example, right, of unclean foods, of sacrifices, things along that nature, right? This is the consistent teaching of the church, right? So we see this in her Catholic theology manuals from the 1950s. We see this in the teaching of St. Thomas, with the teaching of the New Testament. We see this also in the teaching of the Council of Florence, as well as now the papal encyclicals. We're going to look at one more now. This is going to come from Mistici Corporis, right? So Pope Pius XII, Pope, who I believe is the last like truly Catholic Pope, if you will, that we've had. And then we're going to be diving into some of the craziness, both at Vatican II, and then touching upon the famous prayer for the Jews, how this has been altered in the new Mass, to something that I would label as, at least in the technical sense of the term, proximate to heresy. It's very concerning. All right, so here we are now at Mystici Corpus on the mystical body of Christ by the great Pope of holy and happy memory, Pius XII. And we're going to be looking at, right, specifically... This section right here, paragraphs 29 and 30 from Mystici Corpus, where this holy pope talks about this discussion that we are having. He says, And first of all, by the death of our Redeemer, the New Testament took the place of the old law, which had been abolished. And then the law of Christ together with its mysteries, enactments, institutions, and sacred rites was ratified for the whole world in the blood of Jesus Christ. For while our divine Savior was preaching in a restricted area, he was not only sent, but to the sheep that were lost of the house of Israel. The law and the gospel were together in force. But on the gibbet of the death of Jesus made void the law with its decrees, fastened by the handwriting of the Old Testament to the cross, establishing the New Testament in his blood shed for the whole human race. To such an extent, then, Pope St. Leo the Great, speaking on the cross of our Lord, quote, was there effected a transfer from the law to the gospel, from the synagogue to the church, from many sacrifices to one victim, that, as our Lord expired, that mystical veil which shut off the innermost part of the temple and its sacred uh, sacred secret was rent violently from top to bottom? Right. The answer to this is yes, there's this, transform, this transformation that's taken place. He continues and he says, on the cross, when our Lord, uh, when the old law died, so on the cross, the old law died, soon to be buried and to be the bearer of death in order to give way to the New Testament of which Christ had chosen the apostles as qualified ministers. And although he had been constituted the head of the whole human family in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, it was by the power of the cross that our Savior exercises fully the office itself of head in his church. Quote, for it was through his triumph on the cross, end quote, according to the teaching of the angelic and common doctor, right? So St. Thomas, quote, that he won power and dominion over the Gentiles, end quote. Amen to that. 
and by the same victory he increased the eminence of treasures of grace, which, as he reigns in glory in heaven, he lavishes continually on his mortal members. It was by his blood shed on the cross that, God ang that God's anger was averted, and that all the heavenly gifts, especially the spiritual graces of the New and Eternal Testament, could then flow from the fountains of our Savior for the salvation of men, and for the faithful above all. It was on the tree of the cross, finally, that he entered into the passion or possession of his church, that is, of all members of the mystical body, for they would not have been united to his mystical body through the waters of baptism, except by the salutary, right, the saving virtue of the cross, by which they had already been brought under in a complete sway of Christ. Side note, isn't it really nice when you're reading a pope, and it's just so thoroughly Catholic? It's so nice. It's so good. But the teaching of the church, again, is clear on this matter, that the Old Testament has been buried. It's been abrogated. It's been abolished with the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church has suppressed or replaced the nation of Israel, right? The Old Testament is done. Now, all that being said, how does this line up with what the post-Vatican II popes, the council, and the new mass teach on this issue? When we get into this, you're going to see how this is at best ambiguous, slash there's a divided consensus, but at worst, proximate to heresy, if not downright heretical, whenever you read a lot of what we're going to be diving into. It's pretty crazy on this matter, so buckle up, stay tuned. So here we are now at the famous dogmatic constitution, Lumen Gentium, from the Second Vatican Council, and we're here at the kind of famous Lumen Gentium paragraph number 16. Now, I want to be as nuanced with this as I can because I don't want to fall into an extreme of thinking that this is completely fine when it's it's not, especially in the way that it's butchered and phrased. But I also want to give at least as much benefit of the doubt as possibly can right, to what is being said here. So when we look at this, right, this whole discussion is talking first and foremost about the economy of God and about, quote, the people of God. Now, Look with me at this first sentence. It says, finally, those who have not yet received the go the gospel are related in various ways to the people of God. Now, the people of God is this ambiguous term. Some people believe that what this means is the mystical body of Christ. That would be a nice way of saying it. But really, when you look at a lot of the commentaries on this, the phrase the people of God, and you see this even in Ratzinger's commentary on the Second Vatican Council, it's kind of a catch-all phrase that means just all people in general, right? So it's somewhat confusing what this like officially means, this phrase. Um, I think it would be better to say, finally, those who have not re received the gospel in various ways are related to the Catholic Church, right? Um, but I would add a lot of shades of nuance in here that this doesn't work. So he says this, in the first place, we must recall the people of whom the testament and the promises were given and from whom Christ was born according to the flesh. On account of their fathers, this people remains most dear to God, and for God does not repent of the gifts he makes, nor of the calls he issues. Now, this is what is confusing about this paragraph. This phrase is taken from St. Paul's writings, but it's used, generally speaking, by a lot of people who want to say that the Jews are still the chosen people of God today. And, it, and if we look here, it says, on account of their fathers, this people reigns most dear to God. Okay. But then it says, for God does not repent of the gifts, nor, the, nor of the calls in which he issues. Okay. It's a bit ambiguous here. I don't know. To be fair, right, whenever we go down further into this document, there is the necessity of conversion, right, as we can see down here, right? Therefore, or whoever is to promote the glory of God and the procedure of souls, right? Must be mindful of the command of the Lord to preach the gospel to all nations. The church must minister the foster of missions and give that attention, right? That's good. But why would you say that the gifts of God are not recalled when, in fact, in this context, right, the Old Testament is done? What does this mean? We have to compare this now to other various sections of Vatican II, particularly Nostra Aetate, to potentially get an answer of what this means, as well as looking at what have the different post-conciliar magisterium said on this subject? So here we are now, before we dive into Nostra Aetate, I wanted actually to show you guys this. So this comes from a work called the Jewish Christian Dialogue, particularly section number six. And this comes from Walter Casper, right? He says this, quote, Therefore the church believes, and he's really commenting on the post-council teaching of the church, 
Therefore, the church believes that the faithful response to the Jewish people to God's irrevocable covenant is salvific to them because God is faithful to his promises, right? So, again, it's some of this kind of quasi-ambiguous language. What is this irrevocable covenant, right? Is it the New Testament or is it the Old Testament? That's the thing. What are you guys specifically talking about? It doesn't make full sense. And I could see how one can make a good interpretation or one can make a bad interpretation. Later down on in Nostra Aetate, it says, The Jews should not be presented as rejected or cursed by God. The church deplores all hatred and persecution uh, and other manifest anti-Semitism. I also agree, right? You shouldn't be persecuting or hating people or um, conducting yourself in anti-Semitism. But what does this new phrase mean? Does it mean that the church of God is um, under – that the Jews, rather, are in the church of God by the Old Testament, that they're saved? Or does this not mean that? What does it fully mean? So particularly in the catechism of the Catholic Church is where I think you see the most blatant contradiction. You start to see this ambiguous language in Lumen Gentium and Nostra Aetate. You see Cardinal Casper, right, start to say these really weird things about this irrevocable covenant. But then in paragraph 121 of this section of the catechism, you run some major, I would say, explicit problems. So first and foremost, paragraph 120, it cites, just so we get the context, it cites the list of the books of the Bible, and it nails it, right? But then when it dives into the Old Testament, paragraph 121 is what I see is very concerning. It says, the Old Testament is an indispensable part of the, of the sacred scriptures. Okay, that's totally fine, right? We can't have the New Testament without the Old Testament. But then notice this. Its books are divinely inspired and retain their uh, permanent value. Agreed. For the Old Covenant has never been revoked. What? What does that mean? The Old Covenant has never been revoked. When you go on to try to see if there's some broader general, you know, if you will, understanding, it says, indeed, the economy of salvation in the Old Testament was deliberately so orientated that it could prepare for and declare the prophecy of the coming of Christ, Redeemer of all men. Okay, yes, I agree with that, right? The Old Covenant prefigures and shows the coming of Christ, even though they contain matters imperfect and provisional. The books of the Old Testament bear witness to the whole divine prodigy of God's saving love. These writings are the storehouses of the sublime teaching of God and the sound wisdom of human life, as well as the wonderful treasury of prayers in them. So too, the mystery of our salvation is present in a hidden way. Okay, all of this is true, but the issue is what does this phrase mean? The old covenant has never been revoked. It has been revoked. It's done. It's over. The only good way I could try to read this paragraph is maybe what they mean by the phrase revoked, it's never been revoked, as it's like saying that the Old Testament itself um, has not been revoked in the context of that it has value. But see, it says the Old Covenant, not the Old Testament. The Old Covenant has never been revoked. It says Old Testament is an indispensable part of sacred scripture, agree with, but there's a difference between the Old Testament, right, as part of scripture that we can learn from, and then the Old Covenant has never been revoked. The Old Covenant has been abolished. It's been done away with, right? And this is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is why, this is one of many reasons why I don't think that you guys should um, bother using the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, get yourself an older catechism. It's much, much better. But this is something very concerning. And as you're going to see, it gets even more concerning when we get into some of this ambiguous flip-flopping around language, not just of Cardinal Casper, but also into some of Pope Benedict XVI, John Paul II, and Pope Francis. So let's go ahead and take a look into that. Maybe they'll be able to share uh, more of light on what all of this is talking about. All right, so finally, to finish up, we're going to be looking at these interesting statements that actually a few people have been putting together on the Wikipedia page about this discussion. So whenever it gets into what particularly Pope John Paul II believed about this— We'll start off here because you're going to see how Pope John Paul II, it seems that he almost believes in like a dual covenantalistic theory. Basically, the idea that there's a New Testament and an Old Testament covenant still in act today. It's a bit confusing. So it says, further developments in Catholic thinking on the covenantal status of the ethnic Jews were led by Pope John Paul II. Among his most noteworthy statements on the matter is that which occurred during his historic visit to the synagogue in Mainz where he called the Jews the, quote, people of God of the Old Covenant, which has never been abrogated by God, for the gifts of God are the calling of God are irrevocable, 
how can you say that the old covenant has not been abrogated and that the Jews are the people of God? This is very concerning, to say the least, especially in light of everything that we just saw with Catholic theology. In 1997, John Paul II again affirmed the Jews' covenantal status. He says, quote, the people continue in spite of everything to be the people of the covenant and despite human infidelity, the Lord is faithful to his covenant. Again, what covenant are we talking about? How can the Jews be faithful to the new covenant? They're not. And the old covenant's gone. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Cardinal Ratzinger, right, John Paul, or Benedict XVI, he wrote in 1999 in his work, Many Religions, One Covenant, he says the Sinai Mosaic Covenant is indeed superseded. So Benedict XVI is dead on the money when it comes to this particular phraseology. But John Paul II seems to be taking a different route. Now we're going to get into a little bit more with Cardinal Casper. It says the post-Vatican II shift toward acknowledging the ethnic Jews as a covenant people has led to heated discussions in the Catholic Church over the issue of missionary activity directly toward Jews, with some Catholic theologians, with Cardinal uh, Avery Duell's reasoning that, quote, if Christ is the Redeemer of the world, every tongue should confess him. 100% agree with that, while others vehemently oppose, quote, targeting Jews for conversion, end quote. Weighing in on this matter, Cardinal Walter Casper, the then president of the Pontifical Commission for Religious uh, Relations with the Jews, that's a a statement that, as someone who's studying theology, just kind of um, it feels like it's just it's just it's just rotten. Like what? What do you mean? He says affirmed the validity of the Jews' covenant, and then continued, "Quote because as Christians we know that God's covenant with Israel by God's faithfulness is not broken." And he tries to quote again from St. Paul here, missions understood as a call to conversion from idolatry to the living and true God does not apply and cannot be applied to the Jews. This is not merely an abstract theological affirmation, but an affirmation that has concrete and tangible consequences, namely that there is no organized Catholic missionary activity toward Jews as there, uh, as there is for all non-Christian religions. What? So basically he's saying because the Jews don't worship idols that we don't need to have tangible missionary activities toward them to convert them to the Christian religion. And even Jelly Gaudium, Pope Francis, right, he says this, quote, We hold the Jewish people in special regard because their covenant with God has never been revoked. For the gifts and call of God are irrevocable. The church, which shares with the Jews as important part of the sacred scriptures, look upon the people of the covenant – and their faith as one of its sacred roots with her own Christian identity. As Christians, we cannot consider Judaism as a foreign religion, nor do we exclude the Jews among those who, we, who turn from idols to serve the true God. Or we include, rather, nor do we include the Jews among those who turn from idols to serve the true and living God. With them we believe in one God who acts in history and with them accepts the revealed word. This is blatant error. 1 John chapter 2, verse 21 says, He that denies the Son does not have the Father, but he that confesses the Son has the Father also. You can't say that we believe in the one God together when the Jews don't acknowledge our Lord Jesus Christ. And if they do not acknowledge our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the epistle of St. John, the first epistle of St. John, they do not have God the Father. And then you would be uncharitable in not evangelizing them? This is egregious hatred. For the Jewish people. The Jewish people need Christ. The Gentile people need Christ. We all are one at the foot of the cross in need of our Lord and Savior. This is egregious, egregious, egregious. He goes on a little bit more and he says, uh, similarly, the words of Cardinal Casper, quote, God's grace, which is the grace of Jesus Christ according to our faith, is available to all. Therefore, the church believes that Judaism, as the faithful response of the Jewish people to God's irrevocable covenant, is salvific for them. Because God is faithful to his promises. This is wild. This is wild. You're saying that the Old Testament is salvific for the Jews still. This highlights the covenantal relationship of God with the Jewish people, but different from Pope Francis in calling the Jewish faith salvific. In 2011, Casper specifically repudiated the notion of displacement theology, clarifying that the New Testament for Christians is not a replacement or substitution for the fulfillment or uh, but the fulfillment of the old covenant. The fulfillment replaces it by necessity. It, if you have a new covenant, you don't need the old one anymore. It, it's wild. It's crazy. 
These statements by Catholic officials signal a remaining point of debate wherein some adhere to a movement away from suppressionism, right? The church's traditional teaching on this, and others remain with a soft support of suppressionism. Now, of course, our boys here, they get it right. Traditional Catholic groups such as the Society of St. Pius X strongly oppose the theological developments concerning Judaism made at Vatican II and retain the hard suppressionist view, meaning everything I just outlined in the Catholic faith, right? Even among mainstream Catholic groups, the official teach, uh, Catholic teaching element of soft suppression remains. Now, it gives this example again right here. The covenant, the catechism of the Catholic Church refers to a future co uh, cooperative repentance of all the parts of the Jews. And this is true, right? It says the glorious Messiah coming uh, is susp uh, suspended at the every moment of history until the recognition by all Israel, right? For the hardening has come upon of Israel because of their unbelief toward Jesus, right? That's all correct. This full inclusion of the Jews in the Messiah's salvation in the wake of the full members of the Gentiles will enable the people of God to achieve this measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in which God may be in all, may be all in all. The church teaches that there is an integral uh, continuity between the covenants rather than a rupture. Okay, I agree on all of that, but that doesn't support the idea that the fact that paragraph 121 says that the old covenant has not been revoked. What does this mean? This is something that's very egregious. All right, so to finish up now, we're going to be going ahead and looking at the crazy changes that have taken place to the liturgy when it comes to the famous prayer for the Jews on Good Friday. Now, looking here, right, at this first section, this is the pre-55 prayer for the Jews, right? This is the famous, infamous one that's caused so much controversy, but again, prayed by uh, literally hundreds of millions of Catholics for thousands of years. So the prayer reads this, quote, Let us pray also for the faithless Jews, that Almighty God may remove the veil from their hearts, so that they may too acknowledge, uh, Lord, um, acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. And then it continues right after a moment of silence, and it says, um, Almighty and eternal God, who does not exclude from thy mercy even Jewish faithlessness, hear our prayers which we offer for the blindness of, the, of that people, that acknowledging the light of thy truth, which is uh, in Christ, they may be delivered from their darkness through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Right? So the big things that are not liked in this passage is the discussion of the veil of the, uh, over their hearts and their faithlessness, right? Not believing in Christ. Now, of course, you see this is kind of quote-unquote revised, right, in the 1955, and it says, Let us pray also for the faithless Jews. Almighty God removed the veil from their hearts, so they may to acknowledge Jesus Christ our Lord. And then it says, let us pray and kneel. Really, the major thing that's done here is that in the older missile, right, in the pre-55 missile, people don't kneel, and in this one, they do kneel. The reason that they don't kneel traditionally is because the Jews kneeled in front of Christ to insult them, and so the church is not going to kneel for them. Now, in the 62 you see a lot of confusion continue to add. John the 23rd changes the prayer to, let us pray for the Jews, that Almighty God may remove the veil from their hearts so they too may acknowledge Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray, let us kneel, right? arise, Almighty and eternal God who does not exclude thy mercy from the Jews. Hear our prayers which we offer for the blindness of this people, acknowledging thy light of truth, which is Christ, that they may be delivered from the darkness to the same Jesus Christ our Lord, etc. Right? So it takes away the, the phrase, Perfidious, right? It takes away the idea of the faithless Jews, etc., right? The unbelieving. Now, here is where it gets really concerning. After the council, right, after Vatican II, this is where you start to get a lot of this quasi odd theology thrown in. The new Mass Missile says, right, this is 1973, quote, let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God, that they may continue to grow in the love of his name and faithfulness to his covenant. Now, if we just stop there, that's just borderline proximate to heresy. There's just no way around that. Because, again, you don't have the Old Covenant anymore. What does this mean? And then this is where I think it, it's saved from direct heresy. It says, Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promises to Abraham and to his posterity. Listen to your church. We pray that the people you first made for your own may arrive at the fullness of redemption, which we ask this through Christ our Lord. So again, it's implying that there is a partial redemption, a redemption that can take place outside of the full redemption. And it's praying that they remain faithful in God's covenant, 
but it doesn't explicitly say anything about the person of Christ, about the new covenant, nothing. Right. So all of these former prayers that we just read, they're all praying that they may acknowledge Christ. This one doesn't pray that at all. It just says that they may arrive at the fullness of redemption. Benedict the Sixteenth, writing some more in Pontificum, he changed the sixty-two to say this: "Let us also pray for the Jews that our Lord and God may illuminate their hearts and they acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Savior of all men, Almighty Eternal God, who wants to all men to be saved and come to the recognition of the truth. Propitiously grant that even the fullness of Thy people may enter the church and all Israel may be saved." That's all right. It's not necessarily great, but it's all right, right? Um, and then finally, right, you do see down here, this is the final version. And so this is in the 2011 edition of the new mass. Quote, let us pray for the Jewish people to whom the Lord God first spoke, that they may grant them to be advanced in the love of his name in the fullness of his covenant. Again, pretty ambiguous, pretty rough. Mighty and ever living God who bestowed upon the promises of Abraham and his descendants, hear graciously the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Essentially, the exact same ambiguous phrase that you see inside of the New Mass Missal. So what do we make of all this? Well, when we compare the Council of Florence, ex quo by Benedict XIV, the Sacra Theologia Summa, the 1950s manual, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, the dogmatic definitions of Florence, right? All of these things, and we compare them to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Lumen Gentium. You know, Lumen Gentium and Nostra Aetate are ambiguous. They're not outright wrong. They're just not helpful. Um, and you could definitely see some political maneuverings there. But then when you look at John Paul II, right, and his statements, you, of course, can read more about John Paul II, but they're confusing to say the least. Um, and then the catechism of the Catholic Church, and it just gets it flat out wrong in my mind. I just don't see how you, you correct that if you're saying it's not been revoked, the Old Testament has not been revoked. And then on a practical level, when we look at these prayers— the new mass missile is completely uncharitable. It follows in line with what Cardinal Casper is saying. Don't evangelize the Jews. Don't try to send missionaries to them. And it's just praying that they may attain the fullness of salvation and glorying in the fact that they have a covenant with God. It's very egregious. All right, everyone. All that being said, make sure that you guys say a prayer for not just the Jews, but also the heretics, the schismatics, and all those who are far away from the person of Christ. Make sure and smash that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Also, go over and support us at patreon.com slash traditional Thomas as we're entering into this latter half of Holy Week. All of this being said, it's very important for us to remain vigilant, to remain awake with our Lord, and to pray for those who have fallen astray from Christ. So get near that rosary, go to Mass, and do the right thing, and sanctify your Holy Week. All right, everyone, thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, may our Lord bless you, our Lady keep you, and St. Joseph watch over and protect you. God bless.